nima ono stitu falu kiva humo humo nuku nuku apa ua ah aloha here's hoping the rest of the meditation is more understandable than my Hawaiian greeting I'll begin with a story I did not grow up in a crafty house in my home there were three boys four if you count my dad which you probably should five if you count my mom who regularly beat us all at basketball softball ping pong until we were in our 30s <laughs> oh the shame of it Th though we weren't into crafts my brothers and i didn't mind pounding on things and each other. For example, working with my dad, we built a basketball standard from an old swing set. Only basketball standard you'll find with a trapeze on one side of it. <laughs> we dug a well in the middle of our subdivision where no one had a well or needed a well. We hooked up the five ton army surplus generator my dad brought home. It shook the ground for miles, but we always had power, light, and annoyed neighbors. When I think about it, we were an electrified barbed wire fence and a Doberman away from being subdivision survivalists. We could have had our own TV reality show. Honey Boo Boo and the Kardashians had nothing on us. But as I said, we weren't crafty. We didn't make cute stuff out of popsicle sticks and pine cones and macaroni. We had no idea what a diorama was. Uh, we never wove potholders or immortalized our painted hands in plaster of Paris. My brother did paint the posts on the back porch once to look like barber poles, but that didn't go well. <laughs> After that, we only painted things that moved and could be washed, which was too bad for our dog. <laughs> The consequences of my craftless life came home to roost when my eighth grade teacher informed our class we were going to weave Easter baskets for our mothers. Now, I had no idea what Easter was. I'd only been to church once in my life. The only weave I knew was a basketball play, and the only basket we had was the one we'd attached to the remodeled swing set in the backyard between the generator, the well, and our painted dog spot. My art teacher for this project was Miss Mary Frances Hannah, and she was a force of nature, wearing her highest heels, which teachers did then. She might have been four feet, 10 inches tall, 70 pounds soaking wet, if she'd been wearing a fur coat and just had a big dinner. She styled her fire engine red hair by plastering it against her tiny little head like a skull cap. She had to stand on a step stool to use the blackboard. But she was a terror. Neither Paul Pot, nor Sister Mary Mar Margaret, nor William Tecumseh Sherman wielded more power or inspired more fear than she did. She began every class by crouching in the front of each aisle, her head barely above the desktop, sniffing like a bloodhound trying to catch a scent. She cocked her head, her eyes went from side to side, and every so, so, so often she stopped. She drew herself up to an approaching five feet of height on her tiptoes, and she proclaimed, I smell spearmint. <laughs> Then the hunting began. She sniffed her way down the suspicious aisle until she ferreted out the gum-chewing reprobate. Then, after affixing the gum to the criminal's nose, she banished the culprit to the cloak closet, where he usually just took the gum and put it back in his mouth. <laughs> but 
I digress. There were 45 of us in Miss Hannum's art gulag, and we were about to weave Easter baskets for our moms. Now, the civilized kids in class who'd been trained in arts and crafts loved the project. It was a nightmare for me. The wreaths were six feet long. We had to dunk them in water to keep them supple. And they made humming sounds when they whipped around and slapped somebody's arms or face. <laughs> But no matter how hard the slap or how red the market left, there was no crying in Miss Hannum's class. She supervised every flinching twist and turn of our feeble efforts. By the end of the project, our class had more basket cases than baskets. <laughs> I did the best I could. I worked as quickly as possible, cut some corners, used some broken reeds, missed some weaves. I understood why warp and woof were weaving terms. My basket was warped, and it was such a dog that if it could have woofed, it would have. Here it is. Yeah, uh, I gave it to my mom. And even though she thought it was an Easter bonnet, she appreciated it more than Miss Hannum. Miss Hannum gave me a mercy C minus, probably because I never chewed spearmint. My mom kept the basket for many years, gave it back to me when she downsized. I took it home, threw it in a corner, and started dumping keys into it and other stuff in my pockets at the end of the day. And that's the purpose it still has in our house. I'd like to say it's somewhat the worse for wear after 55 years, but this is pretty much the way it's always looked. <laughs> If while I was weaving it, I had known that it would follow me for two score and 15 years, I would have been more careful. <laughs> so, what's the point? All of us are making baskets every single day. They aren't made from reeds and wood. They're made from the acts, the attitudes, the aspirations that we're weaving into our lives. Our baskets will be with us for a long time, and we ought to take great care with them. Our baskets, our lives, aren't just for us. They'll rem remain in the minds and hearts of everyone who knew us. Our kids, grandkids, friends will remember the baskets woven by our words and deeds. Just look at some of the love gifts that are here today. We have some treasures. We have a snake proudly gifted to us by Tanner. We have what I think is an angel playing what I think is a harmonica. We have pictures of Floyd and Charlotte done by their son a couple of years apart. You can see how Charlotte's hair has grown. <laughs> we have on this table a mystery gift made by Milt Hill, his very hands when he was little. We have a pencil holder, we have a metal box, we have a family Rubik's Cube. You twist it to put all the pictures together. It reminds me a lot of my family. Uh, we have cups, we have a lovely little birdhouse, and up here, we have, these are all made by church members or their families. Uh, we have what I thought was an angel, but is actually a pumpkin. <laughs> we have a beautiful house. I was going to say none of this stuff is of museum quality, but we, and we have this mask made by a 10-year-old. Amazing. We have a book. We have a little duck. The 
end of the service, take some time, just wander up and look at the gifts of love that people will keep and hold forever because someone made a special basket. We, we can take hope because no matter how manifestly misshapen our crafts might have been, the grace of God and the kindness of those we love transforms them and us into something beautiful. Every one of these creations is precious, but only those who see with the eyes of love will ever know that. To put it another way, when I brought home uh, this utterly lame basket to my mom, she knew that my heart was in the right place, well, at least some of the time. She took it in, and that's when I knew if she could accept this basket, she would love me, no matter how imperfect I was. And knowing that, though I didn't know it at the time, was discovering the grace of God. Now, grace may be a word that we use so much that it doesn't mean anything. Another word for grace might be kindness. God's kindness extends to everyone, and we're called to be kind to others. Every act of kindness moves us closer to God's light. This isn't just me talking. Take comfort in that. In 1 John 4, it says God is love. Anyone who loves is born of God and knows God. You've heard that one, right? God is love. How many times have you heard that in church? I don't think I ever figured out what it means until this past week. My spidey sense started to tingle when I read that verse, and I went to the interlinear Greek New Testament, which had a lot of dust on it because I don't ever go to it. And I discovered that the word that's translated as love is agape. Love isn't the best word to use in translating that. Agape has a sense of charity, of kindness, of acceptance and caring, no matter what. And so when I reread that scripture from 1 John, substituting variants of kind for love, lights went on for me. God is kindness. It gets better. Anyone who is kind is born of God and knows God. Anyone who is kind is born of God and knows God. And best of all, it goes on. No one has ever seen God. But when we are kind, we become part of God. Think of it. Now, really think of it. Feel it. Rejoice in it. And if you don't take away anything else uh, with you today except a picture of Miss Mary Frances Hannah, remember, God doesn't care what your basket or your life looks like. God only cares that you weave it with kindness and love. God doesn't give grades. God gives grace. So should we. And that, my friends, takes us to communion. Your invitation.